This is Gareth Southgate, and this is the Three Lions Podcast. And welcome to the Three Lions podcast. My name is Russell Osborne, and this is an independent England football supporters podcast. Summer 2021 had all the ingredients to see a trophy won on English home soil for the first time since 1966. Gareth Southgate was a penalty shootout away from becoming the second manager of the England team to lift a trophy. Sadly, as we all know, it wasn't to be. And as poor Bukayo Saka's penalty was saved by Gianluigi Donnarumma, Sir Alf Ramsey remained alone in being England's only tournament-winning manager. In the past, we've spoken with author Graham Morse about Sir Walter Winterbottom, England's first manager. And managers come and go, and when Walter departed, he was replaced by Alf Ramsey. Dave Bowler wrote the biography of Ramsey entitled Winning Isn't Everything. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome him to the Three Lions podcast to tell us some more about him. Dave, hello there. Hey, nice to be here. Oh, thank, you for, uh, thank you for joining us. Hey. It's a, a little, little old, your book on Sir Alf Ramsey. Um, oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> when when did you write this? Blimey, uh, back in the mid nineties. So uh, it's a test of your memory now to to see what we can uh, what we can come up with this uh, through this next half hour or so. What made you write about him? I mean, going back to to when I did it, amazingly, there hadn't really been anything about him since since he'd left the England job. You know, there'd been a, a couple of books around about the, the Mexico World Cup time, but he'd become something of a forgotten figure, really, which given the magnitude of what he achieved and mm. the magnitude of that's getting greater and greater as the, as the years go by, it seemed, you know, a, a bizarre a, a bizarre state of affairs. So so he, he seemed um, an interesting subject. I'd also done a um, book on Danny Blanchfield before from Tottenham. Um, so obviously there was a, a little bit of a connection there. Uh, I know a few people at Tottenham who I'd spoken to about Danny who had played with, with Sir Alf in his time there. So that was a, a good grounding for his his playing career. But really, I mean, you know, the only guy who's ever won anything for England, it seemed a fairly obvious thing to do a book about, really. Absolutely. Did you ever meet him or, or did you know, know his um, feelings on it? No, um, I mean, he was, he was uh, I think he was ill by the time that the, the book came out. So, so no, but uh, I was born in 64, so I just missed the, the, the World Cup. World Cup win, but my sort of my first footballing memories are that World Cup in Mexico, 1970. I remember that quite vividly. I somehow remember it in colour, despite the fact we only had a black and white TV. I don't know how that works, but uh, but he was such a big figure through my growing up with, with football. And then obviously the, the Poland game in '73, which seemed like the end of the world. You know, we'll, we'll come to that later. But it, so he was he was always a major figure, and then. Um, I'm from uh, West Bromwich. He came to, to manage Birmingham as well, just down the road in the, in the late seventies. So he was a figure that was always around at that point, and then he, he just seemed to to largely disappear um, really? from sort of 1980 onwards, and became a bit of a forgotten figure. You know, nowadays he'd be a, a pundit on all the the live games and all that sort of stuff, but he, he sort of disappeared into the background. You, you couldn't imagine, I don't know, taking. Gareth Southgate as the example in, I don't know, 40 years' time. You, you couldn't imagine he would be allowed to to disappear in such a way. Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously Glenn Hoddle does a lot of uh, yeah. commentating and, and and so on now. I'm sure Roy Hodgson, once he's had a rest, will, uh, will be wheeled back out into the into the fray for that kind of thing. So, yeah, I mean, obviously it was a different, a different kind of world then, but um, it, no, it seemed a bit sad that he, he was kind of forgotten that way. And I think... Again, we'll probably come into this, but I think that says a bit about the the FA of the time, not really capitalising on on what they'd got, not capitalising on the experience and knowledge that, that he'd accumulated over over a period of time. Yeah. Well, I mean, the idea of this chat was just to to find out a little bit more about him and 
obviously predominantly his his England time. But he he was born in 1920, um, obviously around the the war years. Obviously grew up um, and and found his way into. He was actually part of the England playing team. So Walter Winterbottom, we've mentioned him. He was manager of the teams that went to the World Cup in 1950 and, and infamously lost to Hungary in 53. Alf Ramsey was was playing under him, wasn't he? Absolutely. I mean, he, he was one of those players that suffered I mean, suffered from the war. He came through the war and skate. So, you know, suffering is a, is a relative term. But obviously he lost a big chunk of his career to the war. Um, he was sort of 26 by the time football was... Um, was coming back to you know to, to proper organised games and, and the league started up again after the war. He went to Southampton and basically lied about his age. He was a bit concerned he was 26, 27 and had never played league football at, at that point. Concerned that so, he was not past his sell-by date. Yeah, so he chopped a couple of years off his age and, <laughs> uh, and Southampton signed him up. And then he went on to Tottenham and, and, and you know, a, a pretty um, stellar England career. He, he played in that, in that 6-3 Hungary game. And, and I think that was a big, a big psychological turning point for him because you know he was a huge patriot. That was you know he was England through and through. A real, a real, a really hated the Scots. Had to beat Scotland in in all the, the home international games. And I think having played in that six three, I think he felt it was like a stain on his character and on the, and on on England. And I think that was a big motivating force in uh, in, in later on. Ensuring that England got back to the top of the game, but he was a you know he was a talented fullback, an attacking fullback as well. You know, right in, the, in the days when fullbacks tended to go not much further than the edge of the eighteen-yard box, he was he was into the opposition half. He was a constructive footballer and always was a reader of the game as well. So I suppose right from the from the outset, he was he was somebody who could go on to a, a coaching or managerial career, um, and obviously was encouraging that by. By Walter Winterbottom, you know, as, you, as you found out in your earlier podcast, he was sort of the, the father of English coaching, really. Encouraged Alf to, to go and, and, and do badges and, and, and coaching courses and so forth. And um, ultimately, he became his successor. Yeah. From his playing career, as you say, he had a, a successful playing career because he, he won the double playing for Tottenham, who had that push and run. Style and uh, so you mentioned it wasn't, his... it wasn't a double. The, the double was the Danny Blanchflower team. Oh, big pardon. But they came up and, and won the won the first division at the first attempt in fifty fifty one. Having got promoted the previous year. Yes. Um, and yeah, as you say, push and run. That was that was a kind of a radical approach in English football at that time. I mean, it was very much a a long ball game and you know, charge, get to the other end of the pitch kind of thing. Tottenham were a, a much more possession based football. Push and run did exactly what you would expect it to do. You got the ball, you gave it to somebody else, you ran off into another position to receive it. That suited him, did it? It did, yeah. I mean, it, it it wasn't quick, so getting the ball to do the work, as they say, that was suited him ideally. And he was one of those players that could see a pass, so that 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 made a big big difference. I think being able to play in that style of, of football, and I suppose you know you could trace push and run through. Then to, to, to the way Liverpool played under Shankly and, and Bob Paisley in the sixties and seventies, it was a, a fundamental change for for English football. I think I've read in the book when he was part of the the England setup as a player, he was made captain on on an occasion and was required to make a speech and found it all very daunting. And I think that was something that would later affect his life. I think so. Yeah. I mean, you know, he, he was. Um, a very working class fella, you know, which is absolutely not the picture that people have got of him. You know, with, with the few things you see of Alf Ramsey, uh, little interviews as the England manager, and he's speaking that very clipped, yeah. upper class sort of voice. You know, he, he was born in Dagenham. Um, yeah, even even as the England manager, there were no, apart from the voice, there were no airs and graces. They'd, they'd play at Wembley and he'd stop off at um, Tubby Isaac's bar on the way home for for jelly deals. So, you know, there was no, there was nothing fancy about him. He wasn't a social climber in that sense. But I think you, you've got to put him in the context of the, of the, of the time, you know. If you go back to the, the, the 50s and 60s, anybody you ever saw on television or heard on the radio or whatever always spoke very properly and, you know, yeah. Queen's English, like a BBC announcer, that kind of thing. And so, you know, he, he went and had elocution lessons to uh, to improve his, his speaking voice. 
I think it was a mixed, mixed success, shall we say. I think his voice improved in that sense, but I think he spent so much time thinking about how he was going to say something. He didn't always think about what he was going to say. It became very, um, very mangled kind of right. thing. And, you know, people used to, instead of taking the mechanic and having a working class accent, they, they, they thought he was funny for the way he was talking. But that was that was the England of the time, you know. He was a bit of a Captain Mannering figure, right. I suppose, in that sense. So, you know, I don't think it reflects that badly on him. I think it probably reflects a bit worse on the way England was at the time, maybe. <laughs> his playing time came to an end and he became manager. His first managerial job was Ipswich, wasn't it? I yeah. mean, Ipswich have got quite a connection, really, with, with England when you consider Absolutely, the likes yeah. of, of, of Ramsey and Bobby Robson, quite a few players. Three league titles there. And basically, if you were to look at like a, a time lapse, I guess, of... Ipswich, they literally just went up, 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 up and up, didn't they? Absolutely. I mean, when, when he went to Ipswich, they were third division south. The, the bottom two divisions were split up between north and south. And getting out of that division was a hell of a job because only the champions went up. The champions of the south and the champions of the north went up into the second division. So you had to win your league. There was no finishing second or getting in the playoffs. So it took them a couple of years to get it right. And then once he got it right, they became a, an unstoppable force. They won the, the, the third division south, had two seasons in um, second division before getting promoted. And then 61 62 in the first division, at the first attempt, the first time they'd ever been in the first division, it was down, they won the league. And that was broadly down to his, his tactics. I mean, I don't think English football was quite as rudimentary as people make out at that time, but it was fairly straight jacketed. You know, most teams played the same kind of way. What he did was he had a guy called Jimmy Ledbetter on the left wing. And they always just say, Jimmy looked like um, old man Steptoe. Oh. I met Jimmy for the, for the book, a lovely fella, but, yeah. but they were right, he did look like Steptoe. And Jimmy couldn't run at all. You know, he, he was dead slow, but he, he could pass and he got a brain. And what Ramsey did was he, t- he, he turned him into an outside left, but he didn't play as a winger. He didn't run with the ball. He stayed in his own half. And at that stage, the opposition fullback didn't know what to do. Did he come with him? Did he go? Did he stay where he was? It was just complete confusion. So ultimately, he had a load of space to, to walk into. Then the fullback would eventually come too late. And Ted Phillips, who was a giant um, centre forward, would then run into behind the space that the fullback had left. Jimmy Ledbetter would play the pass. Ray Crawford was in the middle and he should score a goal. Right. And that. They, it sounds ridiculous now to say that that was a revolutionary tactic, but that was, you know, and of course there was no television in those days. Yeah. So if you if you've got an idea, nobody could see what your idea was unless they'd come and watch the game. So he got he got a good year's worth of uh, value out of that in the first division, and they, and they won the league. And um, that's even more extraordinary than when Leicester won the Premier League. I think yeah. they'd been in the third division south three years before. Had never been in the first division at all. A yeah, tiny little club. And you know, the year before Tottenham had won the double, Burnley were a great side, Manchester United were coming again. It was it was it was a decent league. And um, they won and then the, the following season, once they'd run the tactic, then then it was a sort of more difficult year. Yeah. <laughs> I mean looking at where Ipswich are at the moment, I'm sure some of their fans would be crying out for a similar situation to come again. Yeah. <laughs> Also in the book, you, you said that the Daily Mirror uh, ran a poll searching for the for the next England manager, and he topped it. So there was obviously a yeah. lot of people aware of what he was doing. Obviously, without the the likes of TV. Yeah, I mean, yeah, obviously people were still following the, the, the football as, as avidly as they ever have done. But obviously, they did it through the newspapers and, and you know magazines like Charles Booker and so on, rather than actually seeing it. On TV, crowds were, were huge as well. And I think it just reflects what a massive achievement it was for Ipswich to, to win the league. I mean, you know, you, I think at the start of that season, everybody was saying, well, isn't it nice that Ipswich are in the, in the top division? I hope they enjoy it before they get relegated. And I suppose people are saying the same thing about Brentford they had the next season. Yeah. So maybe Brentford will go on and win the league, I don't know. But uh, Brave you know, call I, that. I, <laughs> yeah, that'd be nice, wouldn't it? Uh, but... Um, I, th- I think the scale of that achievement was every bit the scale of, you know, Brian Clough 10, 15 years later with Derby and then with Nottingham Forest. Nobody took it seriously at that point, and yet they they just shredded the league. I think people were starting to 
understand that um, England and, and, and football was moving on. They were understanding that and that England, which had constantly prided itself as, you know, the greatest nation in the world. And all that. But we'd had three or four goes at the World Cup by then and they'd all been pretty ignominious failures one way or another. Um, I think the people by that stage were saying, well, this bloke seems to have an idea. Let's give him a chance. The FA put out a job for the the position of of England manager after Walter Winterbottom left. Apparently 59 applicants applied, uh, including one from a convict, but Alf didn't actually apply and it was actually down to the FA to to actually approach him. So was there a self-confidence thing or I think, I think there might have been a little bit of that I think also he was very much of the the old school he was under contract to it pitch down right and therefore he wasn't going to apply for another job Charlton Athletic had, had, had tried to poach him a couple of years before when he was at Ipswich and he said no I'm under contract and I'm, I'm not interested so you know I think he was very old school in that sense I think you know I've given my word I've signed this piece of paper that's the end of it very loyal um, character Absolutely, and and you see that in the way that he treated his players then with England over over the years. After that, perhaps um, ultimately to to a fall, possibly. But um, yeah, I, I think he you know, he was very much well. No, I, I'm I'm the Ipswich Town manager, and as long as Ipswich Town want me to be the manager, that's how I shall I shall continue. Ipswich eventually said you could, he could accept it. And I, did he initially share the job? As England manager and Ipswich manager, yeah, he was going to. He, he saw the um, the season through to its conclusion because I think it was about the October November time, wasn't it? So he, he took. There was only I think one England game left that season. I think it was the game against France in uh, February March of um, of sixty three. So he, he was able to see that that season out for Ipswich, which again you know it says a lot about his his character. He wasn't going to sort of leave him in the lurch. He was going to see the job through, yeah. give him time to, to find a replacement, which ultimately was Jackie Mill, but, and, and then go on and, and do the England job. I think that the big thing with the England job was he was going to do it the way he wanted to do it. He wasn't going to do it on the same terms that Walter Winterbottom had, had had to do it in, in, in previous years. Well, this was the fact that um, Walter Winterbottom had to work under the selection committee um, and now Ramsey came in saying, no, you, we're going to do it my way. I will, I will pick the players. So he, he accepted the job 25th of October 1962, operative on the 1st of May 1963. And he was so confident that he actually said that England would win the World Cup after a, a particular tour in 1963. Something, isn't it? Isn't um, it? I, I mean, I don't think he was ever short on self-belief. I think he always felt that he knew what he was doing and that if he was able to go and do the job, then the right results would come. And then, yeah, to be fair, if you look at what he did at Ipswich, that pretty much proved to be the, be the case. You know, he was in charge of that. He was in charge of the tactics, in charge of the team. They went and won the first division. Yeah. So I think he had a lot of faith in that. He obviously knew that home advantage was was going to play a massive part. I mean, that, you know, that that's always been the case. You know, you look at England's history and um, in the latter stages of competitions, other than 1990, we've only ever done particularly well at home. Even even to the, to this day, really, other than in in Russia as well. But I think I think he also saw that there were world class players coming as well. And and I think you know this is one of the, the things that, that gets missed a lot of the time. People talk about managers as though they're alchemists and you know they're magicians and they can do all sorts of things. The more I look at football and the more I read about it and the more research I do on various projects, the more it's have you got the players. If you haven't got the players, then you're going to struggle. Now, you can mess things up if you've got the players. You know, you can treat them wrong. You can put them in the wrong position. You can pick the wrong ones. But if you, if you haven't got the players, then you, there's, a, there's, a, there's a ceiling to where you can, yeah. you can take them. And I think he saw, you know, we've got Bobby Moore, who was obviously going to go on. He, he played, just played in the 62 World Cup. And Bobby Moore was obviously going to be a great player. Gordon Banks was coming through as a great goalkeeper. Bobby Charlton was there, so he could see already that there was the the beginnings of a of a very good team there, and he felt that he could harness that. And with you know three years preparation time, he felt that you know he felt that he could do. It. I think also it was, I mean they call it now positive visualization and that kind right. of stuff, don't they? But I think setting that target and saying, well, you know, 
I mean, England had had four ter- pretty terrible World Cups since I'd actually joined FIFA and, and started participating. So I think he felt it was important to be confident and say, yeah, we can go and reach that level. We can we can be that. But he just, you know, he believed in himself. And um, I, I think he wanted to carry the people along with him and the players along with him. Yeah. Before they got to the the World Cup in, in 66, by all accounts, it, the job was a bit of a struggle and, and Ipswich actually offered his offered him his job back if if it didn't go to plan, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they were always particularly... Well, I mean, you would be, wouldn't you, if you were, if you said you'd be keen to get well, him yeah. back, given what he... What he, what he I mean, it's a difficult job for, a, for an England manager when you've got a home tournament, I think. For any international manager, when you've got a home tournament, because all you're playing is friendlies. And yeah. however you want to do that, it's never quite the same as playing in a competitive qualify the home internationals was a little bit different because they were properly co- competitive at that stage but obviously the, the quality of the opposition particularly was 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 variable you know what northern ireland and, and wales in particular didn't always have great players at, at that stage so there wasn't quite that focus that you get from having to, to get the points on the board to qualify for a competition and i, I think as well people they talk now about, you know, Sven only had a certain number of England players to pick from because we've got all the foreigners in the country. You know, we've brought players in from Spain and France and Italy and whatever. Well, it was the same in, in the 60s, because but they were Scottish and they were Welsh yeah. and they were Irish. So, you know, I think Alf used to say quite regularly, people say I've got hundreds of players to pick from. I've got about 50. You know, who were of the age, good enough, playing at a high enough level. So I think... He was sifting through the players that he'd got, trying to make, make his method work. And I don't think he'd, at that stage he'd quite settled on a method either. You know, there was, I think a lot of England managers suffer from this. There's a demand from the public and from the press that England win, and they win by playing everybody off the pitch and scoring five goals every time that they go out and play an international. We know and that, that from still, just yeah. months gone by, yeah. Exactly, exactly. That's always been been the way, and it was particularly prevalent then because you know the the standard of international football was quite variable, uh, far more so than now. And England was supposed to be the best, and they were supposed to play the best. And I think he was trying to live up to that a little bit, and that didn't necessarily suit the players that he got and the way that he believed in in, in playing. So it took a while to settle into. Um, to settle into it. And, and I think also we had a bigger picture in mind. You know, if you're playing in 1964, does it matter whether you win? It matters whether you win in 1966. Yeah. So I think he was he was trying players, he was trying things, trying ideas, always with the view that sort of by the early part of 66, then he would have his he would have his, all his ducks in a row, as they say, and be ready for that competition. And and that was that was the the, the intelligence of having that bigger picture. And using that time of not having to qualify, using the time of the friendlies to, to proper effect, but it, it didn't always sit well with the with the press and the public. No, well, he didn't care. <laughs> once the World Cup did come round, he told his players that the next two months would require utter dedication, but the reward would make any sacrifices worthwhile. And this is where I've got his voice in my head, where he says, "Gentlemen, if anybody gets the idea of popping out for a pint, and I find out." He's finished with this squad forever. So he, he laid the law down, didn't he? He did, didn't stop Jack Charlton going over the wall, but that's another story. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, and again, I think it, it's it's a generational thing. He'd come through the war. His generation had come through the war. A lot of those players, not all of them, but a lot of those players had done national service. So they understood the importance of sacrifice in a far bigger picture. In the finish, football's only a game. You know, it's not a war. Nobody dies. Yeah, you, know, you play you play a game of football, and you win, and you lose, and you know you be you're ecstatic or you're disappointed. But it's it's no more than that. They'd been playing a, a, a bigger game where people did unfortunately die. Where you know there was a a bigger thing involved, and I, and I think with that in mind, it was a perfectly reasonable thing to do. It was perfectly reasonable to ask of those players because you know those those couple of months were going to change their lives forever. Not in not quite as dramatically as it would now if you went to the Cup, I suppose. But you know, they are still England's immortals, aren't they? Yeah. Those eleven, twelve blokes who played in the in the you know, you had Jimmy Greaves in there as well, probably to the to the to the team that won it. 
or if all you've got to do is for two months get your head down and work a bit it's not that much to ask is it and I, and I think with you know the events of 20 years previously still in mind I think that you know he felt well I'm not asking you for very much am I no just don't have a drink for two months and you know you win the World Cup so I think we could all do that if we yeah, if we knew what the prize was is it at the end so I mean the World Cup got underway it started with the uh with a draw against Uruguay, didn't it? A nil-nil draw against Uruguay. Did he? How did he feel about that? I don't think they, they were too upset about it. I think the first game, and particularly when you were the host nation, is always a big emotional um, event. You know, we saw that again with, with England recently. Your job is to get through the group. Your job is to win the group. You don't have to play. You don't. You don't get the medals for winning six 0 on, on the first game of the, of the competition yeah. I think he was easing the team into it and he was still playing in a slightly different way I think he was he was deliberately disguising the way that England were going to play in the later stages because he's still in, in the in the three group games they played with a winger different one each time Terry Payne was one of them and Callahan was one of them the, the windless wonders as they, as they became weren't unleashed until we got to the to the later stages he played it once once or twice in, in, in games leading up to to the World Cup, but I, I think you know he understood the value of shock uh, with Ipswich. They'd had great success with that, with people not knowing what they were going to do, and I think he wanted to do much the same with England. So he felt he got enough to get through the group playing that way. That's proved to be the case in the end. I think it's us, it's us, the supporters who get excited about the group games. I think managers and players are much more professional and pragmatic about it. Well, we won, didn't we? We got through the group, yeah. didn't we? That's yeah. all that we had to do, you know. We're, we're, we're focusing on that game seven games down the line, six games down the line. You know, we're not focusing on this 90 minutes. We did what we had to do. Okay, it was only a draw. It wasn't particularly great. We didn't lose. That's the that's the first thing. Win the next two games and we're, and we're on our way kind of thing. And that was what they did. They beat Mexico 2-0, then France 2-0. But after the, the group stage, apparently England were, were only 10-1. to 1. To win the uh, to win the tournament, so was there not some a lot of faith? Odds, isn't there? There's some odds ten to one yeah. when you get down to the last eight. It's extraordinary, really. Of course, we always view it from here. You know, we know what we know what the ending of the film was. Yeah. So it's <laughs> it's a different a different thing. I, I think within the home nation, there are always expectations far beyond you know the reasonable. In in this country, it's it's either feast or famine, isn't it? With the best team in the world or with the worst team in the world. You know, because there's a, there's a lot of that about it, I think. And there was there was some good competition. I mean, the, the Argentina side that England faced in the in the quarterfinal were a very very good team. Eusebio was Eusebio was probably the the star of the tournament at that at that point in the Portugal side. West Germany looked a good team, so there was there was competition there. Um, and England were going to have to beat probably the three best three of the best teams in the competition to get through to the final. The, the way that the draw worked out, so I suppose you know things weren't looking that good for them on, on that. But I mean, ten to one is ridiculous, isn't it? Yeah. In an eight horse race, ten to one, and you're at home. Yeah. You mentioned that Argentina game because that kind of brought out his prickly side. Really? <laughs> I mean, what if the whole <laughs> uh, was it? Is it Ratim, the Argentine yeah, player? Yeah, yeah. Um, obviously, there's there's the footage and the pictures of. Was it Nobby Stars trying to change swap shirts? Uh, George Cohen. George end, Cohen, big pardon. Swap shirts, yeah. And he, he, he didn't take have. kindly to that, did he? Uh, we will not swap shirts with these people. <laughs> these people. I mean, again, it's contextual to, to the time. The way that South American football and Latin football was played was different to the to the the way Northern European football was played. And, you know, I've spoken to George Cohen about this a couple of times and you, he said, you know, you'd be running along and you'd suddenly get somebody raking their studs down the back of your leg. You'd be standing next to somebody for a corner and they'd be pulling the, the short hairs off the, the, the back of your neck and that kind of thing and they'd be spitting at you. And that was all standard fare in South American football. That was the way they played. Yeah. And the South Americans were terrified and horrified at the way that Nobby Stiles would launch himself into a tackle because that wasn't the way that they played there. So there was, I think there was probably a bigger divide in the, the cultures of football between South America and Latin countries and, and, and Europe than there is now. So there was always that um, clash at, at World Cups and, and, and so on, because it was 
they, they were so foreign to one another. Ratting got him sent, himself sent off fairly early on for trying to referee the match effectively, sort of towering over the, the referee and telling him what he, was, what he should be doing and, and all of that. The great thing about the England team at that stage, and that comes from your question a minute ago about the, t- the two months of sacrifice, the discipline in that side was absolute. Nobody retaliated. Nobody got themselves sent up. Nobody, you know, not even Nobby Styles went there to kick at anybody. They were absolutely calm. They did the job and, and they won the game. And yeah. in winning that game, they discovered Jeff Hurst as well, who, who scored the goal. Yeah. Uh, Jimmy Green's injured. Jeff Hurst came on. The wingless wonders took shape. And then that became the England team that, that went on and won it. So in every possible way, that Argentina game is, is probably the pivotal one of the World Cup. Yeah. Bobby Moore said of Alf Ramsey, he made us proud to play for England in that manner, I guess, that that he was. Um, I mean, you mentioned Portugal, obviously, in the semi-final, but we fast forward to the final, and we all know how that obviously panned out. I've just got these pictures in my mind as well, that when the final whistle went, he, he remained sort of static on, on the bench, didn't he? Whereas you see managers now, I mean, after three minutes when England scored against Italy in the final. Gareth Southgate was pumping his fists and yeah. and that. Whereas Alf, talk us through that, what you know about he that. Was, he was completely in charge of all the all his emotions, I think, at all times. And again, that was the way he'd been brought up. That was the, the England of the stiff upper lip and uh, and all that sort of thing. Walter Winterbottom wouldn't have been doing any of that kind of thing either. You know, that, that was the, the England that they'd grown up in. I think as well, I think it was Ray Crawford I spoke to at Ipswich and he said, you know, he would never come out of the dugout in a game. He would never stand on the side of the pitch and shout instructions or whatever because he felt that that would be embarrassing the players. You know, he sent the players out on the pitch. They should know what they're doing. If I'm standing there telling them what to do, I'm just making them look stupid. So, he, you know, he would never do that on, on principle. That looks a very interesting position now, 60 years later, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> It, it was at the time, and I think the final itself, England had been in shock, and they'd, they'd won the World Cup, and then with, you know, what, 20 seconds, 30 seconds to go, which is the last kick of the game, West Germany equalised, and you've got to go to extra time. So I think even even Alf Ramsey, in, in control of himself, was was in shock for a, a few brief seconds, and then he got, you know, went out onto the pitch to talk to the players, and he wouldn't let him. See sit down you know they all they've, they've had 90 minutes of exhausting football they've just let go on. and of course they wanted to slump onto the pitch get up get up yeah. don't let the Germans know that you're tired look at them they're all sitting down they're all exhausted you know they can't carry on and then you know the famous you, you've won the game once now go and win it again and in in extra time England you know, whether Jeff Hurst shot went over the line or whatever England were the better team comfortably the better team and, and deserved to win win the World Cup on the day I think Again, that goes back to, to those two months of sacrifice and hard work, you know, being able to go the distance. But again, I come back to the to the point that if you go through that England team, it is full of world class players. And I mean genuinely world class players who would get in the world with them. Gordon Banks, Bobby Moore, Ray Wilson, Bobby Charlton. You know, Alan Ball would have been close by then and he was only twenty one then. Martin Peters would have been very close. Jeff Hurst would have been very close. I mean that's that's some team. It is the best. I think it is the best England team has ever been. In yeah, obviously, for their time and yeah, it's a different game now and, and all of that. But in terms of the quantity of world class players that you had, I think that is the best England team that has been. And, and I think that was why he had such absolute belief in. If I get him in the best shape possible, if I get him to understand the tactics, I can leave them to do it and they'll win. That was it. Yeah, and and when they did. But what surprised me, he didn't lap it up as in, he, whilst the players went on a lap of honour, he uh, he told them, it's your day, you can enjoy it, and he walked down the tunnel. Yeah, yeah. again, Amazing. I mean, it speaks of another England from, yeah. <laughs> from a long, long time ago. I can, I can just very vaguely remember that kind of England uh, from when I was about four or five, just. But, I mean, things changed rapidly from yeah. there, and the managers became figures as big as, as the players and bigger, you know, in some cases, you know, you think about Bill Shankly, you think about Don Revy, Terry Venable, Ron Atkinson later, you know, the manager became the, the Sven Gardy figure, really. Whereas I, I think he always felt he was a facilitator. He was the one 
that pick the team and, and set the conditions to allow those players to go and do the job. I think he always missed playing football. I think he always regretted and was perhaps a bit bitter about the fact that he lost so much time to the World Cup. Um, I don't think he ever saw management as a suitable replacement for being a player. And I think he always understood that as a manager, he wasn't a player anymore. He wasn't one of them. Yeah. He was He was over there. He was, in, he was in a different camp. And I think, again, behaving in that manner, got the best out of the players. You know, they, they didn't see him as somebody that wanted the glory, that they saw him as somebody who wanted them to succeed. He wanted them to have the best. And, you know, he, he looked after them, he shielded them. But uh, Nobby Styles after the, the French game in, in the, the group stage, and it was a horrendous tackle. He went through one of the French players. And the, the FA said, do you really need to pick Nobby Styles anymore, Al? And he said, well, if, if Styles doesn't play, then I'm no longer the manager. Wow. And he stood by he stood by him absolutely. And that's in the middle of the World Cup. Yeah. You know, he was willing to resign just before the quarterfinals of the World Cup because he picked the team and he was absolutely behind his players. And I think that's, you know, one of the greatest methods of getting the best out of people is to is to support them. After we won the World Cup, the following year, New Year's honours, he became Sir Alf. <laughs> How did he take to that? Yeah, I kind of wondering what his sort of persona would be becoming sir. I, I just think he was extremely proud of it, really. I mean, as I say, he was the ultimate patriot. He was absolutely, you know, obsessed with England and uh, and all of that stuff. So to you know to go to the palace and to you know, become a knight of the realm and all of that, and it, and it was it was a you know very unusual. That's uh, you know, I think Stanley Matthews had. That is knighted before them, but I don't think there'd been anybody else in right. I don't think it was a winter bottom of her, I don't think. Matt Busby was later on, obviously, after after sixty eight with, with Manchester United. So it was a it was a massive honour. And I, I don't think it could have been been an but I don't think it changed him. And, and again, I come back to that that point about the elocution lessons. It wasn't uh, a social climbing thing. It was just to try and fit into that version of England. I mean, the irony is, is that, that that then overtook him with the way England changed in the 60s and the 70s and the Beatles and, you know, the way England moved on. But I, I think his England, you know, was, was all about duty and responsibility and honour and all that sort of stuff. So for somebody like him to, to receive a knighthood would, would be the absolute pinnacle of it all. Yeah. So the honour of winning the World Cup was there. The honour then of defending the World Cup came to Mexico in 1970 and that was a bit of a, uh, a struggle with with a lot of the things that went before that, wasn't it? What could go wrong did go wrong. Yeah. I mean, there are, there are all sorts of other elements to to the to the Patriot. I mean, it went to the extreme that only England could do things properly. So they went out to Mexico, and uh, he insisted that they took their own orange juice with them to Mexico. I mean, <laughs> that's a slightly absurd. Um, a level of uh, defending your own country. I'm not sure we grow that many oranges in England, but by the by. There was a sort of a paranoia when they went abroad. I think that, the, that, that you know, the locals were always out to get them. Um, yeah. And to an extent in, in Mexico, that's understandable. I mean, you know, before the Brazil game, there were people outside the, the hotel till three o'clock in the morning making a row just to stop the England players sleeping. There was obviously the Bobby Moore incident in Bogota with the, with the bracelet and so on. Yeah. And, and that seemed to be a setup to, to try and disrupt him because England were seen as, probably with Brazil, the favourites to win the World Cup in 1970. I think that's, that's, that's reasonable to... And, you know, not everybody in, in South America and Central America would want England to win the World Cup. So I think there were attempts to, um, to throw it off guard. But I think England... I wouldn't say they were going through a transitional phase because they were still a great team but they weren't perhaps quite as good um, as they were in 66. Fundamentally, because Bobby Charlton was, was coming towards the end. Jack Charlton had finished. And they were, they were playing in the searing heat and at altitude. You know, that's difficult enough for anybody. Yeah. But as you're coming towards the end of your, of your career, as Bobby Charlton was, it's, it's you know, absolutely horrendous. So I, th- I think... England did well to get as far as they did. They got as far as you would expect. They probably should have got to the final. The West Germany game, I mean, was, was a disaster on every every possible level, probably the biggest disaster 
in one game that, that he had, and that started the day before with with Gordon Banks going down with, with food poisoning. Uh, and when they when they told him that it was Gordon Banks, he said it could have been anybody other than him. And I think that that was right because I mean Gordon Banks was the best goalkeeper in the world. Yeah, at that time the, the Pele save everybody knows, of course. And Peter Benetti, you know, poor devil, has, has forever been known as the as the man who had to play in that game. And um, yeah, having he kind of had more than five or six caps, I don't suppose, for England over the years because obviously Gordon Banks was the was the number one, and to be suddenly thrown into that game twenty four hours notice, that that was difficult to say the least. And then it went, you know, it went against him. Um, and then there was there was substitutions throughout the game that he got criticised for, wasn't there? Yeah, yeah, and 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 I think I mentioned the the, the sort of the change in attitudes um, that caught up with him. I think the change in the game caught up with him as, as well. Substitutions, the first World Cup where there had been substitutes. He was trying to understand. I mean, I, I think Alf Ramsey's view on football was: I've put eleven men out on the pitch. They're the eleven men that should win the game because I've, I've chosen them, and they're going to play how I want them to play, and that's what's going to happen. In Mexico, in the heat and the the altitude and all of that stuff, I think it was understood that we've, we've you know, you you are going to have to bring on fresh legs because it's it's an exhausting environment. Yeah, and with England too, you know, winning comfortably against West Germany and seemingly going through, it seemed an ideal opportunity to give uh, Bobby Charlton 25 minutes off and just see the game out. And you would have thought England would do that, you know. How many times in you know, Ramsey's round did England concede two goals? Not very many. You know, so it seemed a, a done deal. And then, of course, it meant that Beckenbauer was freed from the, the strictures of marking Bobby Charlton and he came into the game more there was a, a flukish goal with Uvi Sale and it hit the back of his shoulder and looped into the net and, and then they lost in, in extra time. It was, again, one of those games where the 20-odd minutes, everything that could go wrong yeah. went wrong. Yeah. You, know, you you get days like that, no matter how good you are, how bad you are. Hindsight's a wonderful thing and automatically, because he's made substitutions when you were winning and then you end up losing, you point to the substitutions. Well, Colin Bell came up. Now, Colin Bell was, he was a great player. Genuinely great player, Colin Bell. He wasn't Bobby Charlton, but I mean, most teams in that World Cup would have had Colin Bell in their team, you know. So you you weren't bringing mugs on. Norman Hunter, you know, went on and won loads of things with Leeds United, won 30, 40 England caps, whatever it was. So you weren't bringing on poor players. But, you know, we, we forget, don't we, you know, a football match isn't about our team and nothing else. There's 11 blokes running the other way, trying to do something about it. And so, you know, sometimes a mistake changes a game. Sometimes a team gets a second win. Sometimes a goal changes everything. You know, that's that's football. That's why it's such a great game because you don't really know what's going to happen when, when you kick off. No. And unfortunately, he, he came out on the wrong side of it. And however good you are as a manager, not every decision works. And that no. day, those decisions didn't work. At the same time, if Gordon Banks had been between the sticks, you know, nothing against Peter Benetti, but England would almost certainly have won the game if Gordon Banks had been gone. It's all a if, buts and maybes. We're just, yeah, just absolutely. never know. But that was to be really sort of the start of the, well, I mean, not the start of the end, but it, it, I guess if you were to pinpoint a uh, a time, because then... Obviously, a, f- a few years after um, we came to 1973, and I guess looking back at 1970, you'd say, "Well, England will be in the next World Cup." Little did people think that it'd be 1982 until we next appeared in you one. You couldn't imagine England not being at a World Cup at that point. It was, it was, you know, beyond comprehension. I think you know what's interesting in in the bigger picture is sort of 71, 72 onwards starts the debate that we've never resolved since about uh, pragmatism versus flair. And I don't think we've fixed that one since then. Because I think, you know, up until 1970, all of those players that, that he picked for England were of a similar sort of background to himself, by and large. They'd done national service. They'd come through an England in the aftermath of the war. They, they were about service and duty and responsibility and stuff. And then you get to, to 70, 71, 72, and you start getting players you know, with long hair and 
beards and moustaches. And, my God, the world's coming to an end. You know, <laughs> you get football. You get footballers who look like Beatles and pop stars. Jeff Hurst said to me when I was I was doing the book, I talked to him about um, I think people like Alan Hudson and Stan Bowles and, and, and people like that. And I said, you know, there always seemed a thing that I didn't trust flair players. And, and he said, you know, with respect, there's a difference between flair players and world class players. And I think that is the fundamental thing. You know, you can talk about Frank Worthington, you can talk about Alan Hudson, you can talk about Tony Curry and one or two others of, of that period. And they'll all have their champions because they were fantastic entertainers and wonderful to watch. Did they play great every week? Probably not. You know, there were, there were games when you when you would go out to see Frank Worthington and he wouldn't touch the ball. And oh. then there were other games where he'd have the ball for 90 minutes, score three goals, you know, and, and everybody would come away drooling. And that I think that was the big thing with Alf Ramsey. He wanted somebody who he would put on the pitch and every week it would be seven out of ten. Every time. And occasionally you get an eight or a nine, but you would never get a six. And Frank Worthington, you get a ten, and then you get a four, and then you get a six, and then you get a nine, and then you get a three. In league football, you can perhaps get away with it because there's always a game next week. You've got 42 games, 46 games, whatever it is, in the season. With England, if you lose one qualifier, then it's a long way back. You know, If you lose in a tournament, you've lost, and that's the end of it. And you know, I, I think we had... Some of that with, with Gareth Southgate, you know, everybody, why isn't he playing Jack Grealish? Why isn't he doing this? Why he? Well, because Gareth Southgate needs to win seven games to make that tournament a success. And he wants the blokes that are going to give him eight out of ten every game. Now, had Jack Grealish played more football in that, perhaps England would have won the competition. I don't know. Nobody knows. No. But I think it's the, it, that is the, the, the dichotomy that English football has had ever since then, ever since the, the 1970s. I don't think we've resolved it. I think, you know, as fans and as media, we want to see, you know, we want to see all the player players. We want to see all the, the fancy dams. And all. We want to see the ones that excite us and entertain us. We want to see all them playing. We don't want to see, you know... Four out of ten players. Today, players who do, do all the hard work, you know, mm. the, the ones who, who make it possible for those players to play. Whereas a manager knows that if he puts those players on the pitch, he'll get a certain thing out of them. And that was constantly the problem. And I, I think you know the, the point that Jeff has made is absolutely correct in terms of the flair players, but also in terms of the standard players. England hadn't got the world class anymore that they had between 66 and 70. You know, Bobby Charlton had gone. Bobby Moore, I think, played for too long for England because of Ramsey's daughter that we, we spoke about earlier on. Jeff Hurst was ageing. Ray Wilson had finished. Gordon Banks had the, the car accident and, and we were left in a position with Clements and, uh, and Shilton. They were both what, 23, 24, I suppose, at the time, so only up and coming. Goalkeeper. The team was was taken apart in that in that sense. And also, I think there's a there's a time limit on any job, isn't there? Particularly in, in management. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, if you look at the 1972 game when West Germany came to Wembley in the, the quarterfinals of the European Nations Cup and absolutely wiped the floor with England 1-3-1 they were playing a new kind of football by that stage not dissimilar to what the Dutch did with with total football Nets had controlled that game completely and England looked old fashioned at that point and I think he tried to change a bit but he got caught between two stools of, of the tried and tested and what he knew and what he wanted to play and what he, you know, instinctively what he wanted to do. And we've all got, you know, we've all got things that we fall back on and whatever, whatever work it is we do or so forth. But he wanted to play a certain way and he knew that he couldn't and he couldn't quite break out of that straight jacket, I think, at the end. Going on to the, to the, the World Cup qualifying, God, it was a difficult group. I mean, the, there were three teams in the group, only one of them qualified. You've got Wales who weren't, Mugs and Wales is a local derby, yeah. So that automatically makes it more difficult. And Poland ended up finishing third in the World Cup once they qualified. So Poland, you know, we all, you know, obviously Brian Clough's famous thing about the goalkeeper being a clown. And, yeah. and uh, back in, in those days, we just thought that all these teams were, were rubbish and did what the with them. That wasn't the case, I suppose. In a lot of ways, it was no disgrace to lose to Poland, but it went on to finish third in the World Cup. We, we, we drew with them, yeah. didn't we, at Wembley? Yeah. We drew that final game. Yeah. Uh, having lost in, in, in Poland, 
I think you know that 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 defeat in Poland sort of underlined that his time was up and and that he could take loyalty to far because Bobby Bobby Moore played in that game and Bobby Moore probably was past his best at that stage. He made a mistake in that game that cost him win the goal, cost him the game ultimately. And then they had to win that game at Wembley. And, and, and I, I watched that back not too long ago. How they didn't win that game is important. Yeah, to, but they hit the post, I don't know how many times. They were encamped in the Polish half. They, were, they must have had about 30 shots a goal or something. Yeah. One of those nights. Yeah. What was the the feeling at the time, sort of after the next few days? Was Were people calling for his head? Because there was no, the FA didn't come out and... And say anything. They they kind of even gave him a vote of confidence, didn't they? I think from the, the FA's perspective, at the time he could not possibly have been worse, because three days before the Poland game, Brian Clough had resigned at Derby County. Yeah. Now Brian Clough was sitting there without a job, and if, if the FA had sacked Alf Ramsey on the Thursday morning after the Poland game, the newspapers on the Friday morning would have been all Brian Clough for England, Brian Clough for England. Yeah. So I don't I don't think. Um, I think, ironically, Brian Clough saved his job for about six months. He, he saw it through to the summer. I, I think it was inevitable he would have to go at that stage. I th- again, it's it's difficult from the perspective of 2021 to think about how things were in 1973. The FA isn't the greatest organisation in the world, certainly wasn't then, but it was quite a loyal organisation. You know, it, it stood by its people. I think it was just in a position where, I don't know, what do we do now? What do we do now? You know, Alf's been here for 10 years. He's won us the World Cup. He's took us to the semi-finals of the European Championships in 68. He got the quarterfinals. In. You know, he's he's Alf Ramsey. He's Alf Ramsey. God, what do we do? The field that, that was there to replace him, well, it was Brian Clough. It was Don Revy. I'm not sure. I can't really think too many others at the time, other than had it been someone like Ron Greenwood, who obviously took it later on. But the, the obviously overwhelming candidates were, were Revy and Clough. I'm not sure the FA felt particularly warmly towards either of them, to be perfectly honest. So I think that I think they gave themselves some breathing space by waiting until the end of the season um, and, and then moving on. But I don't think there was any way that, that he could have he could have kept his job with the way you know supporters are. You know, understandably, if you fail to get to the World Cup, you know, if, if Gareth Southgate doesn't get to the to the World Cup in Qatar, he'll be gone. That's the nature of football, yeah. and it, it was becoming more the nature of football at that point. That you know, if you if you fail, you you were gone straight away. So it was inevitable that he would have to he would have to go on. I, I think there was just a, a lack of appetite amongst the FA for replacing him more than we want to keep him. Yeah. So it was yeah seventy four when uh, the FA recommended that Alf Ramsey be replaced as as England manager, and and from there he was it Birmingham City he. He went Birmingham to. City was there. As, I think he was on the board at one point initially, yeah. um, and then they sacked the manager. As Birmingham City often do, and uh, and he took he took over for about six months. I think it was. At it was never his intention, though, was it to be manager? No, again, was it? no. I think at that time, if you'd been the England manager, that was the end. You know, that was the pinnacle, and there was nowhere to go from there. Yeah. So it was quite a surprise that he, he went back to to being a manager. Full stop. You know, I mean, now nowadays, if Gareth Southgate leaves. Decided he doesn't want a new contract and went now. He'd be a manager at a football club within yeah. a couple of months, wouldn't he? Uh, and nobody would think anything of it then. I think it was, well, you've reached the highest point in the, in the land. You can't, you know, there's not there's nothing else to do. He, he did some coaching in Greece for a while. I don't think any clubs really seriously pursued him at that point once he'd left England. It just seemed to shame that there was no role found for him within the FA in some sort of coaching capacity, some sort of, not director of football, but you know what I mean, that sort yeah. of role, passing on his, his experience and his advice. Of course, the FA didn't like him particularly because he, he'd taken their power away from him. So, you know, a lot of the Blazers yeah. were, uh, still haven't forgiven him for, for picking the team on his own. So there wasn't necessarily that much warmth towards him either. But it just seems such a waste that all that knowledge and, and experience and know-how just disappears. And I think we still do that now. Yeah, that's a, it's a shame because, as we we mentioned earlier, he never really appeared on sort of the the TV as a, a pundit or let's say passing on that that expertise. It's just a, just a complete waste. I mean, I, I don't think 
temperamentally he was necessarily suited for the for the pundit role. Mm. I'm sure he was asked once or twice. I, I vaguely have a memory of him doing something in 1978, I think, at the World Cup, but it wasn't his it wasn't his forte. And I think there were a couple of um, newspaper columns after that where he was critical of, I think, Bobby Robson at one point with England. But I think by and large he didn't like to be particularly critical of people. I think it was, you know, he understood how difficult the job was. He understood how when people started interfering and sticking their oar in and giving their advice, it, it became, you know, a bit difficult. Uh, so I, I don't think he wanted to become part of that that crew. But there must, you know, there surely should have been something for him within Lily Shaw or within, you know, that that wider FA thing to to pass on his his knowledge and expertise. And would, I mean, Don Revy or, or Ron Green, particularly Ron Green, when he got to the Euros and the, and the World Cup, the chance to talk to, to Alf Ramsey about, you know, what, what this is like, how to prepare, how to get through a tournament. I mean, that would have been invaluable, I would have thought. Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, obviously there's... Obviously, his greatest moment would be winning the World Cup. I mean, is that probably how he, he will be seen? It's how he'll be remembered all the time that people are playing that Badil and Skinner record, isn't it? Yeah. Now, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that will obviously be the crowning moment because it's the only one that England have had. But I, I think, you know, his, his achievement was broader than that in that he brought a professionalism to the England team that Walter Winterbottom had tried to bring in and had succeeded to a certain extent but was thwarted by the the committees and the you know the, the various people in the corridors of power at, at the FA I think he was able, Alf Ramsey was able to to wrestle that away from him obviously in terms of team selection but in terms of general interference the team stayed where he wanted the team to stay they went when he wanted them to go the preparation was the preparation he wanted all that kind of stuff he managed to get you know games postponed before um, the Poland game. Not that it did him any good in the end, but, you know. So he, he was a pioneer, although it took years to come around. He was a pioneer in the idea of, you know, international breaks and that kind of stuff. So I, I think his legacy is bigger than just winning the World Cup. I think he brought professionalism to the to the, the Football Association that it, it, would, it hadn't had before and wouldn't have had without his bulldozing it through so I think all the managers subsequently can you know be grateful to him for that even though they probably curse him for having won the, the damn thing and uh, all being judged by that ever after but uh, he has to be the best England manager ever doesn't he because he, he won it yeah simple uh, as that there is a uh, there's a statue of him outside Portman Road um, unfortunately he he passed away with a um, it was a heart attack I believe in in 1999 um, yeah, unfortunately, yeah. yeah um, it's you say it's uh, his his legacy is is more than just just the World Cup, which is good, really. I think. Yeah, you know, club football. He was a you know a giant at Ipswich. Sixtieth um, anniversary of that this uh, this season for Ipswich. They did well to uh, to commemorate that. I think that would give him something to aim from being in the third division. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think he was he was a. The big thing with him, he was a, he was a proper football man, I think, through and through. Mm. Uh, he wasn't interested in the glitz, he wasn't interested in the glamour, I don't think he was interested in the money, because he certainly didn't get any from, from the, the FA. He was interested in, in the betterment of the game, he was interested in winning, yeah. absolutely interested in winning, that was that was all that mattered. Winning isn't everything, it's the only thing, is the full quote from the, from the title. That's, that is the uh, for the title of the book, so we can still purchase it. Um, well, Dave, thank you for your time. I mean, it's what well, pleasure. I know you've you've been writing a little bit more since. Do you want to just give us a little insight into what I else you're doing? There's a ludicrously grandiose project that I'd like to do about all the England managers in some proper detail. Yeah, called the Prime Ministers of Football, because uh, I interviewed Bobby Robson once, and I, I asked him about the the, the England job, and he said. Uh, Oh, it's, you know, what else could it be? You know, what, what could be better than being the England manager? It's like being the Prime Minister of Football. So that seemed like a good title. So yeah. that, that's my plan. Now, I've, I've written a sample chapter, which is just about 1973, Alfred Ramsey 73. The plan is to is to go back to Walter Winterbottom, bring it all the way through to, uh, to Gareth Southgate, but that'll take um, quite some time. That sample chapter is on Amazon, I believe, isn't it? It's on Amazon, yeah. You can, you can find it on there. As a as a self published thing, just for, for people to pick up and see what they see what they think of it. 
Dave. Thank you very much for your time. I, I know you're you're on Twitter as well. If you, you have a projects, if you want to give that a plug, yeah, at, at Magic of Cup is is. Uh... I started doing books about um, individual seasons of the FA Cup. There's a few of those out there as well, man. Good stuff. Well, thank you for your time. And, and yeah, once, once you've got some, some more chapters done, perhaps we can speak again. I'm sure we can. Pleasure. Thanks very much. My thanks go to Dave Bowler there for his time to chat about Sir Alf Ramsey, who to date is, of course, England's only World Cup winning manager. As I mentioned at the start of the episode, Sir Walter Winterbottom was England's first manager. And that episode where I spoke with his son-in-law, Graham Morse, is still available as a podcast. Just give it a search on your podcast provider. Now, when Sir Alf was relieved of his England duties, Joe Mercer took over as caretaker manager. He oversaw seven England internationals. Now, the role of caretaker manager of England is not one to be taken lightly. And he's in good company, alongside Howard Wilkinson, Peter Taylor and Stuart Pearce. They've all taken on that role. And perhaps in the future, I'll concentrate on the caretakers. But Joe Mercer was just keeping the seat warm as the FA had their eye on the next full-time manager. Don Revy would be next. Thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed it. Don't forget, all previous episodes are available at your usual podcast provider. And the Three Lions podcast is on all the usual social media channels, Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. I hope you can join me again for another England episode. Cheers. Cheers.